Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I understand that Jeremy Hunt will shortly announce in the House of Commons that the UK Government intends to impose a new contract on junior doctors. I therefore want to make it clear to this chamber that this will not apply in Scotland. Uh, this is not the way, in my view, to treat health professionals, so we will not impose a contract, but instead continue to work with our junior doctors and other NHS staff in the best interests of patients. Later today... Later today, I'll have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Labour will protect education spending in real terms for the whole of the next Parliament. Will the First Minister do the same if she's re-elected? First Minister. Well, we'll set out our full plans uh, for education and for other matters in our manifesto. But let me just point out uh, to Kezia Dugdale what the record of this government is uh, so far. Average spend per primary pupil, according to the most recent published statistics, has increased by 11 per cent, £496 since 2006. Average spend per secondary school pupil has increased by 10 per cent, £618 since 2006 7 And total revenue spending on schools uh, has risen by 208 million pounds. That's the record of this SNP government. We will continue to act to protect the numbers of teachers in our schools uh, and we will continue to act to address the attainment gap. Uh, and I am happy to ask the people of Scotland in a few weeks' time to judge us on that record. Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. Here's the record of the SNP government. 4,000 fewer teachers, 152,000 fewer college students, and the gap between the richest and the rest as wide as it has ever been. I listened very carefully to the First Minister there, but there was no commitment to protect education spending in real terms for the next five years. So we can take from that response that education spending will be cut again with even more severe consequences. This afternoon, SNP-controlled Perth and Kinross Council will hold a special budget meeting to discuss the cuts they are being forced to make because of the choice that this First Minister has made. That's the SNP-controlled Council in John Swinney's backyard. Here are the planned cuts. 186 pages worth of cuts. Cuts to childcare. Cuts to help for those with additional support needs. Cuts to early year teachers, cuts to maths and English teachers. Page after page contains a warning of SNP cuts that will harm our children's future. That's the reality from one of the First Minister's own councils. So when will she stop pretending that her budget won't harm our children's future? First Minister. First Minister. As Kezia Dugdale is aware, we have put forward a settlement for local authorities uh, that, yes, uh, involves a 2% reduction on their total revenue spending. Uh, that is a reduction offset by the £250 million that we are investing from the National Health Service into social care. And that settlement, which has now been accepted by all of the local authorities in Scotland, enables us to protect households by freezing the council tax. It enables us to protect the number of teachers in our schools. It enables us to invest in and expand social care. And it enables us from October of this year to ensure that all social care workers are paid a living wage. That is the reality. That is the reality of the position of this government. Of course, in the context uh, of a budget cut from Westminster imposed on this government. A budget cut, presiding officer, that Labour, when they, when they campaigned so vigorously with the Conservatives, were quite happy to see imposed on this Parliament. Keza Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. You know, President officer, that ship sailed the moment she stood side by side with the Tories last week to impose cuts on our community. Order! Order! Ms Dugdale! Let's be clear. 
let's be clear about what these cuts really mean. This document here, this is an SNP council, this document here is cutting the entire budget for supply teachers. And I will quote from the SNP council paper directly about the consequences of that cut. It states, classes may have to be sent home and possibly schools closed. That is the scale of the cuts she is forcing on schools. And today, this Parliament will have to set the Scottish rate of income tax for the very first time. The First Minister will have another chance to keep the anti-austerity promise she made to stop these cuts to schools and other vital public services. For years, she has argued that more powers means fewer cuts. Today, the First Minister will have the chance to use these powers to stop these cuts. Will she finally take it? First Minister. Presenting officer. First Minister. Just in the, the interests of accuracy, the ship of Labour campaigning hand in hand with the Tories hasn't sailed. That ship, Labour ship, has been sunk and has sunk <laughs> Scottish Labour completely. But let's turn to Labour's policy of, of raising tax Order, for every stop single the first minister. worker. Let's turn to Labour's policy of raising the basic rate of income tax for every worker in our country earning £11,000 and above. Now, presiding officer. Order. Presiding officer, there is a, there is. Presenting officer, we know how desperate Labour are by the volume of the insults they like Order. to sling across the chamber. But let me say, there is, there is a debate to be had in this country about tax, but it should be a proper grown-up debate about tax. Labour's policy... Labour's policy is written on the back of a fag packet. The lack of detail, quite frankly, is embarrassing, but then it's a policy put forward by a party that knows it is 100 million miles away from being a credible opposition, let alone a credible alternative government. It's a dishonest policy because Labour knows it will hit the low paid. That's why they're suggesting a rebate but haven't been able to answer a single question about how that works in practice. And it's also a policy in its presentation from Labour presiding officer that is out of touch and callous. You know, Kezia Dugdale, Kezia Dugdale stands there as someone who like me, Order. who like me and like all of us has a decent salary. And yet she suggests that increasing the tax bill of the low paid by 5% somehow doesn't matter. Well, I say to Kezia Dugdale, tell that to someone uh, who is struggling to make ends meet. Tell that to someone who suffered years of pay freezes and is counting every penny. It is not fair and it's not progressive to shift the burden of Tory austerity onto the shoulders of the low paid. And that's probably why less than one in three voters back Labour's policy. One moment, Ms Bugdale. One moment, Ms Bugdale. Please sit down. I already warned the Chamber about heckling the First Minister or anybody else that's speaking. There was a remark that came across the Chamber. I didn't quite hear it, but I think from the reaction, I think from the reaction in the Chamber, um, there was the use of a word which was clearly unparliamentary. I will review the official report afterwards. If the member who used that word um, wish to admit it and withdraw it now, that would be helpful. But if not, I will take action this afternoon. First Minister. Sorry, Mr. Dugdale. Mr. Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. It's very clear from the evidence from the IPPR, from the Resolution Foundation, from SPICE, from the House of Commons Library, from Professor David Iser, from Professor David Bell, 
that Labour's proposals are fair and they are workable. That is why council leader after council leader has backed it. That is why union leader after union leader has said it is fair. That is the truth that the First Minister cannot escape. But the First Minister and I have something in common here, President Officer. We both oppose George Osborne's austerity and we both want the best for our country. Where we part is that Labour has a fair plan that will ask some of us to pay a bit more and the wealthiest few to pay a lot more. In so doing, we can stop these cuts, cuts that would damage our economy and stop young people from achieving their potential, cuts that would see councils across the country slash spending on our schools and cuts to childcare that would hold working families back. So faced with the choice between using the powers of this parliament to invest or cutting schools, why does the First Minister choose cuts? First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, Keddie Dugdale and Labour don't oppose George Bor Osborne's austerity. They campaigned with the Tories to keep us subject to George Osborne's austerity. And what, what Labour want to do is not end austerity, but shift the burden of that austerity onto the shoulders of low-paid workers. Now, Kezia Dugdale mentioned the Resolution Foundation. Here's what the Resolution Foundation said. There will be hard cases and poor families will lose out. That was on Labour's policy. She mentioned David Bell and David Iser from the University of Stirling. Here's what they said about Labour's rebate. This part of the proposal would require a comprehensive data sharing arrangement between HMRC and local authorities in Scotland. It would impose a substantial administrative burden on local authorities. There are also questions as to whether such an arrangement would be even possible under the Scotland Act. Labour is perpetrating a contract on the lowest paid workers in our society. The truth of the matter is my tax bill will rise by 2.7 per cent if Labour's proposal was implemented, the tax bill of a teacher or a nurse would go up by 5%. That, presiding officer, is not fair. But I want to give Kezia Dugdale the opportunity. This is a tax rise she wants to see implemented in seven weeks' time. So if she wants to be taken seriously, let her answer these questions about her rebate. How much will it cost to administer? How will First eligibility Minister. be assessed? And how many First. of the half million pensioners who will pay First a tax Minister. rise will even get the rebate? First Minister, the opposition put questions to you. You don't put them to the opposition. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no immediate plans. First Minister. Sorry, Ruth Davidson. For the first time, the SNP Government has taken over responsibility for managing payments to farmers. And here's how they've done so far. We have a botched IT system costing nearly half as much as this Parliament building, which still doesn't work. We have farmers fobbed off with promises that they'd receive their payments by the end of January, and only a third of them have. We now find that ministers were told of problems in 2014, but of course back then they were all too busy campaigning for independence. We know that the, what their response has been. It came in five pages of excuses and lines to deploy that was emailed by mistake from the SNP to everybody in Parliament. So can I ask the First Minister, should her team, instead of getting their excuses in, be spending more time fixing the problem? First Minister. Well, my uh, team, both in government and in uh, the civil service, are working to make sure that we get payments to farmers as quickly as possible. The Cabinet is discussing this issue on a weekly basis. Uh, we are fully behind the farming community and we're doing everything possible to get payments to them as quickly as possible. It is true that processing payments has taken longer than we had intended due to the complexities of the new cap system, and we've been open with farmers and with industry about these complexities and what we are doing 
to address them. Uh, we started uh, paying the first instalment payments to farmers uh, by the end of December. By the end of January, almost 30 per cent uh, had been paid the first instalment, with further payments initiated since then. As of last week, the total number of payments committed was 35 per cent. Area offices are operating seven days a week. IT teams are working around the clock. Additional staff have been taken on in local offices. Uh, Richard Lockhead is working hard on this, has also been working with the banks to make sure that they take this into account in terms of their dealings with farmers. So we'll continue to go on with the job of making sure we get these payments to farmers and we do so as quickly as possible. Bruce Davidson. Blame complexity, lines to deploy, number four right there. Um, she might be quoting straight from that document, but I'll quote directly from the NFU Scotland president, Alan Bowie. He says, time and again, the Scottish Government actions have not matched up to what has been promised. NFUS have lost trust in the system to the extent that the Cabinet Secretary's assertions cannot be taken as given. We also see Today, Audit Scotland is launching its own investigation into this complete failure of management, warning that, and I quote, there is still significant risk to the successful delivery of this programme. The First Minister has lost the trust of rural Scotland. She's overseen yet another government IT fiasco, and farmers no longer have confidence in her rural affairs minister. What reassurance, if any, can she give to rural workers today that this failure is getting the fullest priority of the Scottish Government? First Minister. Well, the reassurance I can give to farmers is we will continue to do what Richard Lockhead and all of us have been doing, which is concentrating on making sure that we get payments to farmers as quickly as possible. I've given uh, Ruth Davidson and the Chamber an update on the statistics uh, so far, and uh, th this uh, continues to change on a daily basis as more payments are made. We continue to work as hard as possible to make sure that as many of the first instalment payments uh, are made by the end of March and the balance of payments as soon as possible after that. Uh, we are reporting progress, as I understand it, weekly right now to the relevant parliamentary committee and to industry, and we are in regular communication with area offices to support faster processing and to unblock any issues that arise. So that is what we will continue uh, to do, presiding officer, work as hard as we can to make sure that farmers get the payments that they are due. Question number three, Will Rennie. What issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet? First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will there any? Uh, we've just heard that councils across Scotland are setting their budgets with £500 million worth of cuts. We've just heard also about Perth and Kinross. Right now, SNP-run Aberdeenshire Council are in their budget meeting. £3 million worth of cuts to education are on the table. But it's not too late for the First Minister to call a halt. Will she pick up the phone or does she want her council to make those cuts? Yes. First Minister. Well, if Willie Rennie had picked up the phone to his Conservative colleagues while he was propping them up in coalition, we might not have suffered the cuts to our budget that were imposed on us by Westminster. Now, as I've said, uh, we have uh, put forward a settlement for local authorities uh, that reduces their total revenue expenditure by 2% offset by £250 million investment in social care. Uh, and what we want to do is work with local authorities to make sure uh, that that settlement protects the things that matter. Teachers in our schools, social care investment, a living wage for social care workers and protecting household budgets. Now, it's no surprise to me that the party that backed Ian Duncan Smith, when he wanted to impose the bedroom tax, doesn't care about increasing taxes on low paid workers. But I do care about that. So we'll continue to take a fair and a balanced approach, and that will be one of the many differences between this government and the Liberal Democrats. Well, there any? God, it's the same old excuses. I would have sympathy. I would have sympathy for the Order. First Minister. I would have sympathy for the First Minister if she did not have the power to do something about it. But she does. The buck stops in that seat over there. This afternoon, this Parliament votes on the income tax resolution. One penny gives £475 million for education for Scotland's children. It's the power to stop the cuts. So she has the power. Why won't she use it? Is it pride? 
Is it our Finance Secretary, or does she simply not care any more? First Minister. As I've said, Presiding Officer, it is no surprise to me that the leader of a party that spent five years in coalition with the Conservatives doesn't care about people on low wages. Yeah. But I do care about people on low wages, struggling to make ends meet, spending every week, counting every penny and every pound. And Willie Rennie's policy of putting a penny uh, on the basic rate of income tax. He's not even pretending that he's going to try to compensate low-income workers the way Labour is. His policy would have everybody earning above £11,000 a year paying more in tax. I don't think that's fair. I think that's transferring Tory austerity to the shoulders of the low-paid. He might want to do that. I'm not prepared to do that. Question number four. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's permission is on the impact in Scotland of the planned UK reductions to housing benefits for vulnerable people who stay in supported and women's aid refuge accommodation. First Minister. Uh, the UK Government proposed to set the housing element of benefit claims to local housing allowance levels, as this is lower than the cost of rent and service charges in refuges and supported accommodation. This will have uh, a catastrophic impact in some of the most vulnerable people in our society who rely on such support for survival. And that does include women fleeing domestic abuse, disabled people, older people and some homeless people. Uh, the Scottish Government is concerned about these proposals, uh, which were outlined in the UK Government Spending Review. The Social Justice Secretary has written to the UK Minister for Welfare Reform to express our grave concerns and to seek urgent clarification on what protection will be provided for those in supported accommodation. Claire Adamson. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Does the First Minister agree that the only way to stop both tenants and providers from the worry and distress being caused by these proposals is if the UK Government make clear now that refuge and supported accommodation will be totally exempt from the local housing allowance cap? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Tenants, I think, urgently need to be reassured that their accommodation will be exempt from the local housing allowance rate so that they don't need to worry about their future. Uh, providers of supported accommodation and refuge accommodation also need to have the security to know that they can continue to provide essential services and be able to plan for the future. Um, the UK Government's proposals mean that there is now real uncertainty about the future provision of refuge and other forms of supported accommodation, not just in Scotland, I have to say, but across the UK, uh, despite an earlier announcement that changes to funding arrangements would be cost neutral. Uh, UK ministers uh, can put an end to this worry now, and I call on them to immediately announce an exemption for refuge and supported accommodation from the local housing allowance cap. Question number five, Jenny Mara. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on Douglas Westwood's forecast for North Sea decommissioning until 2040. First Minister. Well, this report reinforces how important it is to support the sector at this time. Our first aim, of course, is to avoid any premature cessation of production, which is why the UK Government should ensure that the fiscal regime is not a barrier to activity and investment, as it often has been in the past. In addition, we must ensure that the decommissioning process is managed effectively. As we set out in the Refreshed Oil and Gas Strategy published on Monday, uh, Scotland can play a leading role in the development of the decommissioning market. While some decommissioning activity is to be expected over the next decade, there are still substantial reserves to be recovered in the North Sea. Up to 22 billion barrels of oil and gas are estimated to remain. New fields are continuing to come on stream. For example, first production from Total's Lagan and Tormor fields in the west of Shetland was announced just this week. Jenny Mara. Thank the First Minister for her answer. She says that some decommissioning is to be expected, but 150 of our oil platforms are to be scrapped over the next 10 years, making decommissioning an urgent priority if we are to anchor these industrial jobs in Scotland. They are already sailing past our reports down to Hartlepool. Dundee, uh, First Minister, needs a working river, not just a waterfront. I have met with Shell and Decom North Sea, and they have said that decommissioning can happen in our city. We lost out on the 750 renewables jobs that the SNP promised, but we have three factory closures over the last few weeks with lots of skilled people in our city looking for work. Presiding officer, 
to the 100 engineers at Flint question, who Mara? are facing redundancy. Can the First Minister pledge three things? That the oil and gas technology centre will be established in Dundee, that she will find economic development money like she did for Aberdeen for our city, and that she will come to Dundee, meet with our decom companies and see how we can scale up to a full-size industry in our city. First Minister. Well, I'll obviously give uh, consideration to Jenny Mara's specific proposals, although, as uh, I understand it, a city deal uh, for Dundee is still uh, under discussion. And as she will know from uh, the Scottish Government's position on the Glasgow and Clyde Valley and Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire city deals, we are very supportive of city deals. Um, I think it's important to uh, say two things. Uh, and, and to have a focus on two things. Firstly, avoiding premature decommissioning. That's why uh, the announcements we've made around support for North Sea oil and gas are so important. It's why the city deal investment uh, and the additional investments are so important. Um, and it's why having the right fiscal regime is so important. Uh, but secondly, we need to uh, make sure that as decommissioning does start, which notwithstanding what's happening to uh, oil prices right now, is always, uh, has always going to have been the case, we need to make sure that Scotland is playing a leading role. Decommissioning will develop into a major business activity um, and there is huge economic benefit for us from that. We created Decom North Sea, the decommissioning trade body, uh, to capture and share good practice. Uh, we support the OGA's plan to establish a single decommissioning board so that we can drive forward innovation and efficiency. And we're committed to investing in the necessary infrastructure to support decommissioning activity. And that, of course, is uh, demonstrated through the £2.4 million funding from uh, Scottish Government and Highlands and Islands Enterprise to develop uh, the key in, in Shetland. But there will be other projects that we want to support as well. Uh, so we are absolutely focused on this. That is demonstrated in the refreshed oil and gas strategy and I would ask Jenny Mara to engage with that constructively. Patrick Harvey. Scotland is going to be dramatically more exposed to the risks from the inevitable decline in the fossil fuel industry if we simply kid ourselves that it isn't happening already. Isn't it clear that we face a very simple choice? Embrace the opportunities from decommissioning and accelerate activity in that regard as our principal focus, or see those jobs go to bidders from other countries which will gain the international reputation to be world leaders in the industry? First Minister. Well, I, I noticed there Jenny Mara applauding a call for accelerated decommissioning of the North Sea. That seems a, a strange position to take. <clears throat> Can I say to Patrick Harvey, um, I do agree with the first part of his question there. I think, as I hope he heard me say to Jenny Mara, that we should embrace the opportunities of decommissioning. Where we differ is I don't think we should be seeking to accelerate decommissioning. I think we should be seeking to avoid premature decommissioning. And we should also be doing what this government has consistently done, is invest in Ms. renewable Mara. infrastructure and renewable generation as well. So we'll continue to support the North Sea while also uh, supporting where and wherever we can the transition uh, to renewable capacity. I think that's the right balanced approach to take. Question number six, Murdoch Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the latest Bank of Scotland's Purchasing Manager Index. First Minister. Uh, I welcome the recent Bank of Scotland Purchasing Managers Index. It signals the continued expansion of the private sector in Scotland uh, at the start of this year. It also highlights that the services and manufacturing sectors continue to be affected by the challenges we've just been talking about in the oil and gas industry and indeed by the global economic environment. That's why in supporting the Scottish economy we recently pledged £379 million of investment in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire and last week uh, a further £12 million fund to provide financial support for people who are retaining, uh, retraining or undertaking new education. Lord Fraser. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for her response? But despite the positive gloss she puts in it, the PMI report from Bank of Scotland is just one of uh, a series of reports recently that have had a worrying news for the Scottish economy. Yesterday, the Scottish Government's National Accounts Survey showed that Scottish GDP per capita is now 1% lower than the rest of the UK, when two years ago it was 6% higher. In its draft budget, the Scottish Government announced a doubling of the so-called large business supplement for non-domestic rates, which will hit 26% of businesses in Edinburgh, 25% in Aberdeen, 24% in Inverness, and 20% in Perth. How will the £60 million tax raid on Scottish businesses help grow our economy? First Minister. 
Well, the increase in the large business supplement is lower than it was in, uh, I think, 2011. But we have to take, and we've, this has been reflected. This has been reflected throughout our discussions. Uh, we have on one side uh, people wanting us to put tax up on basic rate income tax payers. On the other side, we've got people wanting us to cut taxes for business. Uh, we'll continue to take a sensible, balanced approach to our budget, to growing econ uh, our economy and ensuring fairness for taxpayers. But, you know, Myrtle Fraser uh, puts forward in characteristic style the, the doom and gloom view of the Scottish economy. Now, of course, there's no room for complacency because of the global economic conditions. But let's just look at the reality in our economy. Uh, our economy has grown for three years continuously uh, now. We've got a higher employment rate than the UK as a whole. Employment is now 67,000 above its pre-recession peak. We've got a higher youth employment rate than the UK. Our female employment rate is the second highest in the UK. We're investing where our investment is required and we're continuing to support our economy as it moves forward. So I would hope Myrtle Fraser and the whole chamber would get behind this government as it seeks to make sure we continue to see growth in the Scottish economy. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who live in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.